Ryan Ray and Ben Samuels present Bring In The Closers, a podcast on making deals and doing business. Welcome to another episode of Bring In The Closers. Ben Samuels, Ryan Ray, said that backwards this time. Felt good to let you lead off for once. Ben, how are you doing, sir? I'm doing fantastic. You know, I'm counting my blessings at this point. You know, I, I think that... Uh, when we first started this thing, it was a little bit touch and go. I don't think either one of us were really sure how deep we we're going to get into this thing. But I think we just crossed like 25, 26 episodes. I mean, that's you know, we're, we're making headway. So I'm feeling good. Nate last week was was also positive. So I'm, I'm in a good mindset. I like I like what we got going on. It's been a lovely experience, to put it mildly. A lovely experience. So Huge value add on both sides of the table. A definition of a win-win, let me tell you. Win, 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 win. Yes. All, yes. all of those things. All yes. the wins. All the wins. So let's start with a NAPE recap. Uh, ben, you were there um, with your booth. First off, you were talking about booth placement. Um, you are hoping that you had a good spot. Um, did that turn out to be a factor, or non-factor? How was the foot traffic? And being that you had a booth, you had a lot of people coming to you. Um, what was the general feel that you got from NAPE? Yeah, you know, NAPE was a really good experience for me. Uh, so so tackling those someone in order, uh, yeah, we got, we got lucky or, or – uh, finally got the credit where it's due, whatever you want to call it. But we had a really good booth location. We were uh, in a high traffic area between a, a beverage station and a couple of the major mineral buyers. So I was really happy. We had uh, you know, we had foot traffic the entire day Thursday and, and basically most of the day Friday, which was which, which good. Uh, I think overall the turnout for the conference was was really positive. Um, certainly there was definitely an air of optimism, uh, you know, floating around that there definitely was not last year. And so I, I kind of liked uh, liked the mindset and the mentality. Uh, yes, I talked to a number of people about it and really what I was saying, and I think I even put a post on LinkedIn about this a couple of days ago, um, is that I think the industry is finally waking up to this realization that innovation and collaboration is not necessarily something that, oh, it'd be nice if we could do that, but it's a must have for longevity and sustainability in our business at this point. And I think a lot of the companies are kind of you know waking up to the realization that they're going to need to do things differently. Uh, and I think as a byproduct of that, we saw a lot more genuinely good conversations, a lot more you know, baseline conversations of how can we work together and get this thing done at the conference this year on the on the ground. And so that was that was a really positive indicator. I mean I think right now if you're in the industry, it's a pretty tough time to be in the industry. There's there's a lot of negative uh, uh, you know things going on. There's a lot of negative market indicators. But at the end of the day I think that you know, our business is so cyclical that I think we're seeing the wheels start to turn the other direction. And I'm pretty excited about what we've got on the docket for the next you know, year or two. Uh, whereas, you know, you might talk to some other people and they've got, you know, certainly the, the other side of the coin. Um, you know, I, I know that you were there just for uh, just for a little bit on, on Thursday, uh, but, but it seems like you had a uh, productive week you know, being in Houston. Uh, how, did, how did you find, I mean, do, do you, would you agree with those sentiments? I mean, how, how were your meetings? Yeah, you know, I saw one person on LinkedIn kind of i don't know if railing's the right term but kind of talking about how nape was down and depressing and I've, i didn't get that vibe at all so i don't know maybe i didn't run into those circles or whatnot but um you know it wasn't a hundred dollar all optimism obviously but compared to previous napes and stuff like that then yeah i thought the i thought the i didn't i don't know about the attendance uh the overall attendance year over year compared to last year but it looked it looked it looked full there was you weren't just walking well, up down the I mean, aisles freely you know, yeah, you, no, you just kind of watch say, where you're I mean, going to go and stuff. And I appreciate you wearing the name badge proudly for bringing the closers. I, I love seeing that, and so you represented us well. Well, thank you. You're, you're welcome for that. Um, but, you know, I, everyone I talked to was, you know, um, no one was like, oh, my gosh, the end is near. No one was like, hey, we're, you know, we're going to be in trouble. I didn't hear that. Um, and so – I heard a lot of people trying to figure out, you know, what's next and, and how does that look. And obviously um, the news is, you know, um, during NAEP was probably not a good week. It was it was an easy week. Let me say this. It was an easy week for folks to be pessimistic, and they weren't. And that kind of gave me a good vibe because they could have been down, and they weren't. Um, and our industry is prone to kind of not follow the news in the sense of like they uh, – we, we follow the news, but but – Emo- be emotionally attached to the news and so they, they it seemed to be kind of separated and that was um um i don't know if it's a little bit too optimistic or not but but it, it wasn't it wasn't just like oh man the, the 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 lack of chinese demand the coronavirus you know companies going bankrupt you know for, you know you know all the little slogans you see on linkedin i didn't, I didn't hear any of that I, people seem to be generally upbeat and ready to go 
Yeah, you know, I think there, like I said, I mean, I think there's a lot of market indicators that would that would lead you to believe that we're in a bad time in the industry. But uh, again, alluding to the LinkedIn post that I made a, a couple of days back, I think, you know, candidly, if you're working for a firm or you run a firm or a fund that is currently cash strapped and, and you know, uh, and can't outpace the cost of capital and 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 actively restricting deal flow and project flow because of the access to capital. In my head, that that means if you've played the last five or six years completely wrong, right? Because that I it sounds very easy to say, but I mean at the end of the day, I think there were so many indications that this cycle was going to hit when it hit that it shouldn't have been a surprise. And and so, you know, right now for groups like you know like yourself and some of the groups that you're involved with and, and myself and my network, you know, I, I'm you know, it sounds bad, but I'm sort of licking my chops. I'm, I'm sitting here waiting for the, you know, the, the money to run out for some of these groups and, and for a lot, you know, I think there's going to be, uh, you know, billions of dollars of bankruptcies coming online in the next year to 18 months. And, and I think the groups that are well capitalized and, and not over levered are going to be in a fantastic position to capitalize on that. So I'm, I'm, kind, I'm kind of excited for where we're going because at the end of the day, I think that that cons- consolidation and that kind of reframing our, our market from, Hey, you know, how do we make the news to, Hey, how do we profit most per dollar is a really healthy thing for the industry. Yeah. So let's talk about your booth. Um, we talked about maybe ways to navigate NAPE and some sales tips or I'd say so some just kind of practical advice. Um, anything that someone did that caught your eyes like, Oh, you know what? I should have thought about that. Or on retrospect things you go, you know, man, I wish I would have included this. When we talked about that. Um, no, I mean, I, I think that, I think that I've done Nate enough times and I've done these conferences enough times that, I, that I'm pretty, I had a pretty good idea of what, what I was expecting. Um, you know, they, like I said, I was really fortunate to be in a good spot and I had really good foot traffic the entire two days. And so I was really focused on, you know, wasn't focused on getting into granular detail with anyone or, or trying to get a deal done at the booth. But, you know, I, I was very quickly vetting, you know, some of the people that were coming up were just interested in, what, you know, hearing what I had going on and, you know, or, or had seen me on LinkedIn. And those are pretty quick conversations, right? But there are a lot of groups that came up to me and, and either were, you know, some of the operators in the area of where this asset is or some of the development partners that in theory I'd be looking to work with. And those I'm going to give a lot more of a full stack. Hey, you know, here's what we're looking to do. Here's the proposal. You know, let, let's talk offline if that makes sense. But I mean, in general, I don't think I spent more than maybe maybe three or four minutes most with, with any one person. Um, you know, and that, that was on the long end. I mean, most of, the, most of them were 30 seconds to a minute of just a quick introduction. Um, you know, it helped also at the booth that I did have a, a video on a TV playing that, you know, if, even if I wasn't talking to the person that the video was only about a minute and a half long, but it gave a very clear expectation of here's where the asset is, here's what we're looking to do. If you want to follow up, let, you know, let's talk. Um, and so, you know, I got, I got a ton of follow up to do for, for the next couple of weeks on the conference. And so I'm, I'm really excited about getting some actionable deals done. And that's what we talked about before the conference, right? The, the goal is not to close the deal at the booth. The goal is to plant the seed and then be able to follow up and, and get something going. And I, you know, I talked to a number of groups that I was hoping to talk to, had a number of groups that I'm not, that I wasn't even familiar with that came up. And so, you know, part of that's just going to be working the process and seeing who the best partners are. But no, I mean, I, you know, for me personally and for, or for Source Rock Midstream, it, it was a phenomenal week, made a number of really good connections. Um, and then this week, this coming week, you know, I've got the uh, Produce Water Society Conference. We don't have a booth at that conference, but there's going to be a lot more of the you know, Produce Water focus groups, right? You know, it sounds very generic, but there's going to be a lot of those groups with the presence there. And so I'm really hoping to stack you know, these two together and, and work that into some deals here pretty quickly in the, in the coming weeks. So shout out to former podcast guest Todd Schreiber. It was cool hanging out with that guy. It's the first time I got to be in person. Got to hang out with him a couple of times, and so um, you know that was pretty uh, pretty fun. I had some uh, some fun meetings, but getting to meet him in person was uh, was nice. So I want to give him a proper shout. Yeah, out. absolutely. No, the, well, well done. No, Todd was awesome. I really I really appreciated the, the time. You know, with with a little kid at home, he doesn't get out very much and so it was it was nice to be able to see him uh you know be able to get down to houston and, and get some face time i went, went out with him a couple of nights and so that that was really good uh you know pr- great guy if, you know he hadn't gotten a chance to connect uh, definitely you know, unsolicited uh, uh promotion but but get you know connect with him on linkedin unless sure. he wants to pay for it he can he can send checks i didn't say unpaid i just said unsolicited 
Wait, wait, well, I'm not getting paid. I didn't know. I should have. I negotiated my deal badly, it sounds like. Wow. So, uh, wow. I just, yeah. So, Ben, this, this transition here, you said you got follow ups to do. And um, I don't know if it was NAEP related or, or not, but over the, over the past, I don't know, four or five days, my LinkedIn additions have kind of blown up. And yeah, it's like, and, and most of those people that added me, um, I had a few that just added me and didn't say anything, which is fine. And I had a, I had one guy who added me um, under the pretense of moving his business to Dallas. And you got on to me while we were in uh, Houston for projecting um, on what, what I think people were wanting from me too much. And so I said, you know what? I'm going to give this guy a go at it because here we go. He's um, he said he wants to move to Dallas, and he's from Canada, so – I'll uh I'll give him a little a little leeway here. I think ultimately I, I I quit responding, but I think he's ultimately wanting to wanting to um to sell me some product or service. But how do you handle how do you handle um those weird quirky DM ads that you get from LinkedIn? You know, I've sent you. I'll, I'll kind of pull the curtain back on how I handle them sometimes, but I'm curious how you handle them because uh, I know we kind of. That's a that's a discussion that we have because it, it is you all. You're, I'm always kind of worried that maybe this is the one that's legit. It, it may be the the actual one, but but how do you handle those? Because I'm sure a lot of listeners get them as well. So how do you handle the LinkedIn ads that um, you know once they get into your network, it's kind of under false pretenses. Yeah, no, that's a valid question. I mean, I think so. First off, let me say that I think it really kind of depends on where you are in your business, right? Because you know, people like your, you know, uh, yourself and and and, and me, you know, I don't have the ability or the bandwidth to entertain all of the incoming traffic, right? And, you know, and so there has to be this kind of pre-filter of one of mine. And I think we've talked about it on the podcast, but one of my pre-filters is if somebody connects with me with no message, I'll, I don't generally. I'll read who that you know what their um, you know position is, but generally because we have the podcast, I generally accept almost every invitation incoming. Um, you know, message or not. But if the first message out of the gate is, hey, my name's X, my company's this, I sell this, let's talk about it, let's set up a call. Unless it's something that I immediately, like I happen to have a need for, those messages generally don't get a response from me because I think that that's a, I think that's completely the wrong way to, to, to go about it. Now, if, you know, if, if in the intro of yourself, you mention, hey, here's where some of the value that I can provide your network is, I think that's a fundamentally different proposal. But there's a lot of group, you know, there's a lot of people out there that are just, you know, they're using LinkedIn almost as like a constant contact. And they're just going to send out the same exact verbatim, you know, verbatim message to every single person on their email. And, you know, at the end of the day, I, I, I'm not going to get involved in that for, for a number of reasons. Um, you know, at the same time, you know, the, the group's, so like you and I, I'm in offline and, uh, you know, forgive me if I'm stepping over the line, you can tell me to be quiet. Uh, but I mean, you know, you and I joke offline a, a couple of times. I mean, you and I share screenshots of some of these messages back and forth, right? That we get some for some of these groups. And one of the, the key ones that you and I, I think, uh, react very similarly to is, you know, hey, let me help you uh, grow your business or, hey, let me help you optimize your website or, hey, let me help you manage your wealth. Or hey, let me help you raise funds. Those four buckets, I, I it, it's just it, it rings untrue to me if you're connecting with me on LinkedIn, Cole, and the very first message from the Merrill Lynch guy is, "Hey, let me manage your money for you." You know, be, because at the end of the day, that tells me that at a baseline level, that person doesn't actually care about the relationship with me, and so why am I possibly going to even entertain the idea of put, you know giving them my business, right? Whereas there's a good way to do that. And yeah, and I understand that everybody, including those guys, are in sales. And I understand that at the end of the day, there's a vetting process both ways. And so, you know, but, but it's about tack and how you approach it, right? And, and so I don't respond to a lot of those. Um, you know, and, and these groups, you know, that, that'll uh, tell you that, you know, but, oh, well, I, I won't mention any names, but, you, you know, you sent me one recently that it was like, hey, you know, are, are you looking for an exit in your business? And the response was, you know, a, a candidly, a obviously, you know, not serious response. And the guy comes back, well, yeah, we, we can do that. And I mean, again, that tells me that, you know, the process is flawed. You're just trying to get in the door, however, it, you know, however it takes. And I think at the end of the day, there's a lot of, there's a lot of those guys that think that they can pull one over on you. 
as opposed to wanting to treat you like a true business partner. And so it really rubs me the wrong way. And so I know that was a long answer to your question, but but, but I mean, you and I, I think you and I see that pretty similarly. Yeah, uh, I, do you disagree I, with, yeah, I would with say anything the there? Yeah, the want, financial advisor, right? I would say, if, if you're a financial advisor and you're listening to this, and you want to manage my wealth, that's the term they use, not me. So I, I don't even know why they think I have wealth, but let's just presume that, that – but I, I, like that, I like that they think that about me. But um, it's like, hey, I want to manage your money. It's like, oh, okay, well – uh, well, yeah, I don't know you, so why would I give you my money? Like, I don't I – mean, just because you work for Merrill Lynch or Charles Schwab or TD Ameritrade or, you know, whoever, Raymond James, why, why, why would I give you my money? I don't I don't understand. You you could be just as incompetent as the next guy. And so that would be the first thing. The second thing is um, these companies issue reports all the time. If you want to manage my money, what you should do is, hey, Ryan, I'm with Merrill Lynch. Listen, I'm not wanting to spam you. I don't want to send you a bunch of emails. If you're interested in investment, I will. I just want to see. I will LinkedIn message you a free report. LinkedIn message because you're a LinkedIn message. You know, I can I can unfriend you. I can remove you. You know, a LinkedIn message you a free report. Um, we have one on this, 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 whatever. Pick one, or do you have a specific? You know, something like that. But I, I probably won't respond to all of those, but I might. I might respond to one and go, oh, yeah, I'm curious about um, you know, the Forex or you know, oil and gas or ETFs or, or, or whatever. And then you give me the report. Maybe I read it. Maybe I don't. That actually is going to be far more likely for me to convert on because then I might read it and I might ask you a question. And then I'm asking you a question to see, do you really, did you read this report? Do you understand the report? Because at the end of the day, I don't necessarily need a, 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 um, um, uh, you know, you want someone who's you're you know, friendly with to be your money manager, but you want them to be competent, right? Okay, well, would you mind sharing? I mean, I, I, if you don't want to share yeah. it, but offline, you shared with me a specific question yeah. that you asked yeah. the money managers. Would you mind sharing yeah, that? Because I, I think that's really valuable. Yeah, I, I that say, very quickly. Yeah, how to say what school of economics do you subscribe to? That's that's it. And how often? How often do you get a cogent response to that question? I think I've gotten one. I think I've gotten one. Um, so again, if you know if you're a fund manager, the, and, and, I, and real quick, I've, I usually get I don't know what that means. I usually get that, and it's like yep, yep, which yep. is yeah, which is an immediate disqualifier. 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 Yep. Yep. I mean, like like because you know if if you don't know what school of economics you're subscribing to, or at least the firm that you work for is subscribing to, then there's there, there's nothing for us to talk about. Like you know right, and, and you know. One of the, one of my stories because I, I don't have the same question, but one of my stories you know, that I can point to is you know, uh, and, and I'll you know I won't obviously mention any names, but a guy from Merrill Lynch reached out to me maybe like six months ago, something like that, um, and he you know he said, hey, can we have a conversation? And I and I had a little bit of a low in my day, so I decided I was going to engage. I you know I, I asked, I basically said, you know, um, I generally like to have a lot more control over my investments, and, and so you know, a quiet investment strategy is just not what I'm looking for. I like to have my, my capital work for me. Etc. I work a walk through some of those things, and he came back with uh, with the response of you know basically like you know uh, what their model does, and you can be creative. Now, keeping in mind, I know enough about Merrill Lynch to know that in his response, he was being disingenuous because that's not actually how it works. But let's table that for a second. Uh, but you know, I, I was talking to him, and I and I said, I, you know, I was like, you know. And this might be, have been aggressive, and I don't necessarily even know if there was a positive response that he could have given me back. But I, you know, I got into some granular detail. You know, I, I was like, well, you know, Merrill Lynch was actually fined this amount to, for doing this, and they were fined this amount for doing this, and and this is how they operate in this strategy. And I, I lined out some substantively, like not theoretical, but fact based issues of why you know I wouldn't be comfortable investing my money. And and again, I mean, you know, me saying that there's no. There's no positive response that that guy necessarily could come back with, but I got a non-response. So I, I sent out all these things, and then you know I saw that he read it, and he went radio silent. Which again is it's disingenuous. I mean, if you're if you're looking to engage a client and they and they poke back at, at you know your firm was fined two two and a half billion dollars for doing some explicitly illegal things, and your response to that is I'm, uh, I'm going to disengage, then like how am I supposed to take that? Right? Yeah. If you want if you want the money, you've got to answer the hard questions. You know, at least say we screwed up there. <laughs> yep. Or before my time or, yeah, we fired that guy or, or, or whatever. You need to be able to do that. Now, I think that's where the big financial companies, um, you know, they, they really struggle. And they probably put up a lot of pressure on these guys to, to go out and to, you know, do word searches on LinkedIn and stuff like that. But, you know, um, 
you know, they're, they're essentially just wanting them to push a product, and that's and that's the thing. It's, listen, maybe the product will work, maybe the product won't work, maybe the model work, maybe it doesn't work. But but if I call you up and I say, hey, um, you know, the Fed's you know pumping in money to the repo market, what do you think about that? You you, you, you know, if you're investing my money, you've got to have what you think. Listen, I think this. The the big wigs that run the phone think this. Here's what I would advise you to do. The corporates, you know, you you've got to have that mentality. And if not, then I don't know how how you can hold the money. I'd rather just sit in cash because at least at least the cash I know it's there allegedly. But <laughs> but you know but you know it's like okay well um, you know so um, so we'll see. We had a couple of things before our guest comes on that you want to get into, and I'm not really sure. Let's see how to get how to be given valid passports from countries you've never been you've never visited without being part of the CIA triads etc um that was one hold of the on. things i gotta the take, show I, gotta take I have to take i have to take notes on this one hold on let me hold on this okay, was I, this was one of the things that you want to talk about i thought you have some in, insight into this oh i just wanted to listen i just wanted to like pose the question and listen oh oh you wanted me to answer yeah oh i mean you're the you're the, you're the one with an inter- international prowess that's not me so <laughs> what international you got? diplomat ryan ray <laughs> it's hey. it's really simple it's really simple. If I can deliver this, depending on who you're talking to, obviously, uh, but my, my pitch is pretty simple. If you're talking to ambassadors or, or folks like that, it's, hey, can, if I deliver this, can you give me a, a passport for me and my family? I mean, it's it's that simple. See? That, that's, that, okay, that's, so let me, that, let, me ask you, let me ask you a different question. What uh, So what is the value add of having an additional passport at your disposal? Yeah, that's a great question. So the value add is, you know, you don't own your passport. First off, the government owns your passport. If you ever doubt that, go actually read it. And I know you don't, but you go read it's property of the U S government. It's not your property. So they can revoke your passport. A B if the U S government, let's say you had family in, uh, I don't know what our, I don't know, let's say you had family in North Korea because that's unlikely, but you have family in North Korea. You can't go with the U S passport in North Korea right now. Uh, but other passports you could go to North Korea under. Um, and so North Korea is a bit of extreme, but you could see where the U.S. could have bad diplomatic relations with the nation, and you might have family there or friends there or a business interest there, and all of a sudden your U.S. passport doesn't get you there. The, th- the other thing would be is if you're traveling abroad and you're trying to get from nation to nation, um, certain, some passports have better access without having to go through the visa processes than the U.S. passport would. And so like, if you're in Africa, you have an Africa passport, you can get around a lot easier than you can with a U.S. passport. So, so I'm curious, just for my own, my own edification, um, you may, may or may not know the answer, but so let's say that you had a business interest in North Korea and you had a passport for a country that had a ben, much better uh, relationship and so able to get in the country. Would that potentially have adverse effects on your U.S. citizenship in terms of I mean, if they if they knew you went to the country, would you potentially be facing possibly them taking away your American passport for, for having kind of circumvented or is that not really – that with North Korea specifically, you can complete, you can complete, you yeah, can complete the fifth. Yeah, that. North Korea specifically, I, that's probably the worst one to use in the world. I use it, I know, but that's probably a, a bad one. Um, and also, there is part of me that just believes that when the government says you can't go somewhere, I want to have the right to go there just to spite them. Like it's just nice just to hold it up, say. I can go there if I want to. I don't really want to go to North Korea, but if I wanted to, I could go. And what are you going to do about it? You know, but, but let's just work that out. If they did revoke your citizenship, you wouldn't have to pay U.S. federal taxes anymore. So would that be the end of the world? So are you, are you, are you advocating? We should shoot, we should shoot live podcasts. We should do like a live version of the interview. We can just like reboot the movie, but like do it for real. So uh, no, that's the deal with the passport. It is, it is this, there is other advantages that you can, you can use it in, in someone like myself who I'm not as international as some folks, but for me, it's, you know, like when, you know, when you're in Zimb- you're in Zambia and you want to cross over to Zimbabwe and you got to go get a, a visa and all this stuff. We've had the Africa passport just whoop, go across. And so, um, there are things like, like that that's that's an advantage and so um when you report me for tax fraud and i gotta flee the country having that extra passport works out for me so well listen we, listen we, we can talk about the go bag offline we oh talk oh that's well, are we recording still are we recording still we are we record oh well, uh i always have a taxes on time on time um yeah. Um, so uh, uh, on time and in excess. And, oh, the I, other yeah. I, I tip them. I leave a nice little tip on there as well. So, I mean, they do such a good job. How can you not tip them? I mean, they're they're, they're very effective at threatening you and taking your money at gunpoint. I mean, honestly, they, I mean, they don't charge enough. You should you should give them more out of your own free will. Well, and the government's so efficient with how they spend your money that why wouldn't you want to pay oh. more? 
Oh, I, no, I definitely could not make a better decision with my dollars. No, like they, I, no. I, I mean, it would actually, if they had the time, I would rather like my paycheck go through them so that they could like, you know, just use it and then I get everything else. Let me just you say know, this. Nice. Let me just say this, put this in perspective. The IRS is the Merrill Lynch guy, but with a gun. Okay. <laughs> that's, that's the difference. <laughs> That is the difference. The IRS has the gun in the jail, and the Merrill Lynch guy doesn't. That's why. That's why you give the IRS guy your money and not the Merrill Lynch guy. And nobody finds the oh, IRS. No, if, if the IRS guy finds the DMs, I'm answering that one. I'll oh yeah, you. yeah, yeah. You want to talk today, tomorrow? But I got to call my lawyer first. But after that, I'm on here. I'm on here. It's uh, hey, look, hey, look, my schedule freed up. I don't know what happened. <laughs> Hold on, let me sell this Bitcoin real quick. Okay, yeah, I'm good. <laughs> And, and NSA, he didn't say that actually. That was uh, he was joking. He was joking. I don't have Bitcoin. Bitcoin doesn't even exist. It doesn't even exist. It's, it's like yeah. our current U.S. dollar. It doesn't really exist either. So, um, so yeah. Ben, and the other thing you had is there's something about why I'm owed ten million dollars. Did you want to break that down and make that plea to the listeners, or how did you want to expound upon that? You know I, what I'll say, Ryan, is that you you bring such an immense value to my daily life, even irrespective of the fact that you know. Let's, let's put aside the amount of money that we make together. That's a whole different conversation. But just in terms of like a just just an enjoyment level, I mean, I, I feel like you should be paid very handsomely for the, the for the value you provide. And I'm just kind of bummed that that other people may not see it the same way. So I wanted to put it out there. I wanted to promote you a little bit. That you know, if if you're feeling generous, I mean, Ryan, irrespective of the value that he brings, he would love to get a check that he can go to the bank with. And so you know, if you're feeling if you're feeling good, maybe maybe Robert is coming on here in a minute. But if you're if you're feeling good and you want to just cut the guy a check he's he's more than willing to, to take it on um, oh, i'll cash that, it he, i'll cash it oh absolutely. i'll get the phone oh, out yeah. and scan cash it right there i mean it's 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 instant it's instant yeah so i'm like a squirrel with nuts i just start just you give me nut, i go bury it you know it's it's yeah i'll take your money there's no doubt about it i mean oh and the, the other thing i will mention is if you're really trying to get in front of um and, I, and I'm sorry, I, um, I meant Richard. I, I don't know what I just said. But um, <laughs> uh, if you're really trying to get in front of, Rich, uh, of uh, Ryan on LinkedIn, if you've got a deal that, that the sum of the deal is going to be – what? No, I just mis, I mispronounced the guy's I know, name. I, I'm, on, just, I'm just wow. Like I don't know where this is going. I'm, I'm kind of nervous. This is nervous energy coming out of me. No. I was just going to say if, if you're on LinkedIn and you want Ryan to definitely respond to your DM, if you can put a deal in front of him that is a total value – of at least three commas, you'll get a response. I can, I, I, I'll just say that out loud right now. If it has three commas in the deal, you will get a response probably same day. Three comma LLC, three comma Inc, three comma money. Yeah, that's that's. See, see but now now that you said that out loud, now we have to go register it like right now. Right now, now, like the next thing I'm going to go do is go to the Secretary <laughs> of State website and register it. <laughs> As if I need another. As if I need another. Yeah, I've LLC seen the screenshot of all your more. domains. I've got a few, and you you like own the internet basically. I think you own like Coke dot com and ESPN dot com and Pepsi and yeah, you 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 probably were that guy in like nineteen ninety five, a uh, young Ben Samuels who woke up and started buying domains up everywhere and, and you know, playing you know, I, messed, I mean, I messed up. I messed up. Like one of the first ones that I got was G O O O G L E. I was like really oh, close. Oh, so close. Really close. One you know? one too many O's. Google. <laughs> so briefly, since we're talking about it, actually, I'm not even really talking about it. And I know we've got a guest coming on, but a real quick story for you that, that I think the listeners will appreciate. So uh, some family history of, of my own. Um, now, I'm a ninth generation Texan on my dad's side. So we've been in Texas for, for a long, long time. And one of my ancestors. You're a what generation? Uh, ninth generation. Ninth generation. That I, goes uh, back to family, like Noah's Ark. My family was in Texas before it was a country, or before it was a state. It, we were we've been in Texas since it was a country. Um, that'd be my, like that'd be like two the year two hundred. You you predate Columbus. <laughs> no, no, we my, gotta do this. We gotta do this math here. Like <laughs> about, it was like the, it it was the it was the mid eighteen hundreds. Um, and and one of my ancestors, so briefly, one of my ancestors was actually the first Surgeon General of Texas when it was a country. So and we've been we've been here for a long time. Uh, but fast forward to like the early 1900s, give, give or take. Um, and one of my ancestors was approached with two business or sorry, two investment ideas. All right. So in one hand, there was this incredibly lucrative shovel company that was doing a lot of business, was really good. You know, they, they sold a lot of shovels and he had the ability. He had five thousand at the time to invest in either the shovel company or this little kind of small startup soda company that had just gotten off the ground. 
the soda company was this small company called Coca-Cola. So my ancestor decided to invest in the shovels instead. Wow. And so uh, missed the boat by just that much. Just that much. Just that much. Um, wow. So well, nine generations. I'm going to do the math on that because that feels like, you know, you, you, like when Columbus got here – and uh, who was the guy that burned the boats? Um, Ortega, no, uh, Cortez. Cortez. When Cortez burned the boat, burned yes. the boats. They came up north, and the Samuels were like, "What's up, bro? That's, What's yeah. up? We're here. We're here. Sorry, yeah. we beat you." We've, I mean, if you go, we've been, full, we've been waiting for, we've been waiting for you guys you for a long time. Where's the gold? If you Bring go gold. full thirty years I mean, for each generation, I mean, that's two hundred seventy years. That, I mean, you know, if you go like farther back in the tree, my, my people were wandering the desert for a long time too. So, I, see, know. I think y'all broke off. Like at that point, y'all broke off when they were wandering <laughs> the desert. Y'all got lost. <laughs> they were like at the Red Sea. Y'all crossed the Red Sea. Y'all took a left. They took a right, and next thing you know, you're in Texas. So <laughs> we're going to Texas. See ya. <laughs> Okay, as Ben mentioned, we do have on a guest today, Richard Belote, founding mem- uh, founder at Mustang XR Consulting. Uh, they are involved in using mobile apps, augmented reality to enhance client communication and to facilitate sales and negotiation for their clients. Richard, it's wonderful to have you on the show today. How are you doing? Thank you. I'm doing great. Spectacular. Well, it is a it's an interesting week to be on the show because Ben and I have a truce. So normally I would throw out some mean sarcasm at Ben at this point, but I can't. So I'll I don't even know what to say. It's kind of like I, I kind of ramble here because I can't say anything mean. But Richard, Did you guys you, want me to call back next week next when week. the truce is over? <laughs> no, 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 no. We're, no, we're we're live right no? now. Yeah, it's, it's, we'll do minutes, it. We'll, let me tell okay, we'll do it live. So Richard, tell us a little bit about your company. Kind of kind of hit the high points there, but maybe give us a little bit more unpack at the, at the thirty thousand foot level. Yeah, sure. So um, basically, the uh, uh, um, the niche that, that, that we feel is introducing augmented reality, virtual reality, um, all of these kinds of tech solutions that have now been bubbled up into extended reality, uh, introducing those into solutions that help oil and gas clients. Now, that's, I mean, everything from uh, discovery to production, the entire pipeline um, solutions involving marketing all the way to safety training. Um, and we've been doing this. I've been, I've been doing this personally for about 12 years, 10 to 12 years. Um, and being in the, the Houston area, um, you know, we've kind of hit a couple of downturns um, and there's, there's always a use case. There's always something that, uh, that, that we find that clients can benefit from with these technologies. Now, Richard, also, you know, I don't want to cross streams here and, and tell us if you want to stay just on the Mustang track, but I was curious, you know, uh, it, it seems as though there's a lot of synergies there uh, into Petro Digital as well. Um, and so I was Correct. curious, are, the, are these companies that do they run in tandem or, or is that something kind of addressing another need? If you can just kind of give a, a quick, quick That's peek behind the curtain of that as well. Absolutely, absolutely. So, whereas the Mustang, the the XR Consulting is going to be more of the um, client or um, or uh, customer or employee facing units, like all of the deployments there are going to be through applications that are going to be usable by. Um, you know, a great many people in, in those verticals, the Petro digital side um, that handles the lead sourcing um, qualified uh, generation. And we kind of, we kind of tie that marketing um, into this. So uh, it's very much kind of a one-stop I'm doing air quotes. Like you can see the air quotes, I'm doing the air quotes, the one-stop shop for, for all of those things. Um, and what you have is, Everybody that's involved from a from the, the the girls that are putting the information graphics together or putting the 3D models together or putting the pitch decks together, everybody has an extensive background um, in helping oil and gas clients. So that's kind of the one, you know, you're talking about kind of crossing the streams. That's the one continual pipeline that we really feed through any solution that, that we put together for people. So on the show, yeah, we talk a lot about, you know, Doing deals, sales, marketing, networking, stuff like yeah. that. Um, you're in a space that if I just if I walked into a random oil and gas event, I said, "Hey, I know this guy in augmented reality and oil and gas." He'd go, "Yeah, that's there's no way that's what? happening." Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, t- one of the things I've learned about oil and gas is um, 
you know, the messaging almost has to be unique depending on the person you're talking to because everyone has different interests in, you know, what makes them uh, inside the operators, you know, why they want to hire someone or not hire no, someone. No, that's exactly right. Yeah, so walk us through, like, how do you guys, because it sounds really cool, but, you know, how do you guys determine what to pitch, how to pitch it, and how where it doesn't sound so scary, many, scary where, you know, we're not getting plugged into the matrix? Right, sure. So very first and foremost, um, you know, the, the success in ideation comes from understanding what your client's needs are. Um, and there's, you, you have to kind of let go of, uh, now, you know, just a little, a little backstory. Um, I, I live and breathe video games, AR computers, like, you know, the, all, all of that. I, I grew up with an Atari controller in my hand and I've had every possible system you can imagine uh, up to now. Um, I'm, I'm definitely an evangelist for this type of technology, but you kind of have to let go of that when you start speaking to somebody who is a zero sum, potential zero sum client, right? Um, so the, the, the success in the ideation and the success in the pitch and everything that comes from understanding what that client's needs are. Now, with, within the oil and gas industry, you know, I mean, how many hundreds of thousands of different companies do you have that do hundreds of thousands of different things, right? Um, it's, it's rocket science, uh, but instead of going to the moon, they're you know, going under the crust of the earth. Um, and you're not going to have the same solution put together for marketing mud that you're going to have put together for a safety training, virtual reality safety training on how to um, break down and, and put together a, a draw works or a top drive, right? So the very first thing is making sure that you come to that client um, and you're eager to learn and to understand. Now, having uh, having a background in the oil and gas industry and knowing enough to know what questions to ask, um, I found is probably that uh, that that first step in making sure that they're going to be open to what you have to say after the fact. Right? Does that does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. within, go ahead. Oh, no, I was going to say absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, Ryan and I talked about, you know, at, at length, a lot of the, you know, a lot of the success in these deals and negotiations and, and relationship building simply comes from the, the, you know, the ability to, rather than selling, you know, what, what you, you know, what you have and kind of, put, you know, ramming it down their throat is listening to the need, li- you know, listening to, to where the pain points are and then, you know, framing your, your pitch or, or your, you know, your service in a way that is actually a true value add as opposed to trying to, you know, fit a, what is it, a square peg in a round hole sort of thing? No, absolutely. And, um, you know, it's kind of, uh, it, we're, we're in a situation where, you know, everybody that I, that I work with and all of the, cl- you know, the, the groups that I, that I team up with, everybody has kind of some background in the oil and gas industry. Um, one of the groups that I, that I work with consistently fuel effects here in town, um, you know, the, the head 3D guy used to work for Baker Hughes, right? Not everybody that has a product that they want to sell to the oil and gas industry has the luxury of having that type of background, right? So it's a matter of, I mean, I, I didn't know, I, I, before I was doing this, um, I was a bartender. Before that, I was a teacher. Before that, I was in retail. Before that, I worked at a vet club. I had no idea. Um, but you learn fast when it, when it matters, when, when the difference between you getting a, you know, a second conversation with these groups means you understand what it is they're doing, why they do it, um, what their pain is, you, you learn quick. And I mean, that would be, that would be really what I would, and anybody that's, that's looking into, to pitching to the oil and gas industry, I would say, do a lot of diligence before, you know, you start sending mass emails out about this cool new widget that you have, this cool new gadget that you have. Yeah. So one of the things that, that I've learned um, is there's there's usually a, a handful of standard objections that I'll get in a meeting, and but they're not worded directly. So in other words, they may ask me kind of um, a, a question, and not because I've been asked that question enough and answered it wrongly, because I was actually I, I was actually answering that question, you know, <laughs> enough that I was like, oh, mm-hmm. okay, that's that's not what they're asking. I've learned that when they ask this question. Um, they're actually looking. It means look, something, something else. So I've tried to adapt a pitch now to where I don't hit those type of points directly, but I loosely sprinkle it in there to entice them to ask those questions a little bit more directly. Um, 
when mm-hmm. you think about AI, think about data. Obviously, now there's there's things like um, you know data security. You know who's going to be able to access this. You know the servers crash and stuff like that. I'm sure there's a lot of uh, misconceptions and fear in what you guys do when you're working on your pitch. How do you structure it to where you know it's not a 45 minute PowerPoint presentation that um, on a first meeting that everyone's going to get lost in. I'm sure, but it's also something that you you try to make sure you hit the high point. So how do you find that balance to where you you hit enough uh, where there is things for them to ask, but also you don't pound them with every possible question that they, uh, with every answer to every possible question they could have had you know step one step one don't use any technical terms right nobody needs to nobody needs to know um in in any sort of great technical detail how this application that you're going to put together is going to work how it's going to communicate with their it group how 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 right you don't do you, do, you just never talk about the how um you talk about the why and the when right um, you know, we're going to put this application together. You're not going to have to worry about the following things, right? We're going to deal with your IT group. A lot of times, what the people that you're dealing with, and this kind of goes back to, um, I guess, until just really recently, you know, you had this whole the great shift change thing. And so the people that you used to talk to in these meetings, just, I mean, they were that zero sum, right? They you know, people were having they they would pull out a flip phone in the middle of in the middle of a meeting and be like, "Can it work on this?" And you're like, "I didn't know that still existed. Wow, that's pretty cool." Um, you, you know, so 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 you really try to stay away from any sort of technical jargon, and and it's more about asking questions, getting their getting their pain points, getting them to kind of kind of you're coming in to solve a problem, right? Um, Everything that they do, they're solving a problem, and their problem is fit for purpose. Everything in the oil and gas oil and gas industry is fit for purpose, and it is they they have a um, a great deal of technical understanding for for what their product is. Um, you have a great deal of technical understanding for what your product is. Uh, that's not as important as um, as kind of explaining to them how that problem they have is going to be represented in a digital space. Um, so kind of, exp- so just as a, as kind of a, a point, um, Exxon mobile came to us, um, uh, when I, w- I was working with, um, fuel effects on, on a project a couple of years ago. And they were like, Hey, we've got these, um, you know, a blevy where they have a liquid gas, uh, vessel, a tank, a, you know, big propane tank. Right. Um, and it, the water's not spraying properly on it. It's not cooling properly, and that could lead to um, an explosion. Um, that's that's enough information from that person, and then to tell them, okay, well, this is what we're going to do. We're going to put together a virtual reality simulation where we're going to take the three D models that you have, bring them into this space. We're going to let you walk around the model, and you just you do kind of very low level explanation of what your idea is. Now, along that way, you're going to say things wrong and you just kind of need to wait for them to guide you through that conversation. So for instance, that one, I was like, okay, and we'll make sure that you know, they have the right PPE and they, no, no, we're not worried about that. Well, now you know what you, so you're kind of just pulling that information out of them by giving them a very, very broad description. They'll fill in the details. Um, what they think is important in, in those cases. Um, and then also always having something kind of on hand to show them uh, a picture's worth a thousand words, right? So an information graphics is worth 10,000 an augmented reality experience is worth a hundred thousand a VR experience is worth a million, so on and so forth. Right. The, the more, the more you have to show um, uh, is, is better uh, to a point, right? Um, when you're dealing with kind of the older generation, you really want to make sure you're not showing things that um, are in a completely different vertical, a completely different industry. I'm not going to show an example of a mud simulation calculator that I put together for somebody that is, um, you know, working on uh, on on rig facilitation, right, or maintenance, you know, something like that, or like, like a hardcore physical engineer. Um, so you want to make sure that the content that you're presenting and the examples that you're giving or the um, the media that you're showing to convince them, you, you want to make sure that that's a little bit applicable to to the person that you're speaking with. Now, you can't always do that, right? Because you're always wanting to get new clients, different clients, and, and, and you want to diversify your portfolio as much as you can. Um, but that conversation just kind of really needs to be you doing a slow guiding of them and getting them to answer uh to ask the questions and then answer the questions themselves, if that makes kind of any sense. 
Um, and sometimes, sometimes you have to push back on, um, I've told clients that augmented reality isn't, you know, it's not gonna, it's not gonna help them. It's not, there, there, there's no real benefit from, you know, having, if you've got a company that does software, for instance, an oil and gas company that focuses in software, well, that's pretty, you know, esoteric and that's pretty kind of uh, ephemeral. Um, so having an augmented reality representation of their software might not be as impactful as a mobile application that's just on their phone that shows, you know, how everything works um, in the context of, of widgets and UI elements and so on and so forth. Um, so you do kind of, I, I think you get a lot more of a positive reception from a client. It's kind of that thing where, you know, are we a good fit for you? But even deeper than that, is this particular offering that we have a good fit for you? I know that you just got finished playing Pokemon Go for like three years and you are so ready, Mr. Oil and Gas Guy, to get your augmented reality scavenger hunt going. But let's let's back up a little bit um, and, and make sure that you fully understand uh, everything that is available to you. Yeah, um, so and go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I was gonna say, and 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 asking them questions about, you know, who is the end user? Because it's not gonna always be that guy or that girl that's sitting in that um, boardroom with you when you're having the meeting, or the person that you're talking to on the phone. You know, is this gonna be for marketing? Is it gonna be for training? Is it gonna be used as onboarding? You know, what's the demographic of the people that you want to speak to? That has it. You know, those kinds of questions um, have have huge impact on the your ability to provide for them uh, in that moment uh, an, an idea or a possible solution something that they'll they'll be able to latch on to um you know if you're targeting a younger group if it's onboarding you know you kind of look at telling them things like look this technology while you may not get it while while this may not be something that you are going to utilize yourself personally on on a day-to-day -day basis look at the people that are coming in if at 10,000 hours of, of doing anything, you're considered a subject matter expert, right? On that thing, whatever it is. Um, so look at the people that you're hiring before they even show up to work for you. What are they experts at? They're experts at video games. They're experts at using mobile phones. They're experts at messing around with computers, right? Though that's what they're experts at. If you give them a tool set that's set in an environment that they're experts in, um, your your human capital is going to increase exponentially, right? If you give them a big book or a PowerPoint, you're not going to get, it's not going to be as effective. Um, and, and kind of explaining things on terms of uh, who's going to be using your solution. Uh, I, I think that that can't be stated or identified enough in those kind of early conversations. Yeah, no, I think that's really valuable and, and spot on. You know, one of the things, so my, my, depth of experience or knowledge base in the, you know, the uh, virtual reality and the augmented reality, like you're talking about those worlds is relatively limited, but, but I'm very well versed and, and intimately familiar with uh, more of the blockchain technology uh, applications and whatnot. And, and one of the, one of the mm -hmm. main points, one of the things that I see consistently is, is kind of alluding to your prior point of, you know, there's so many com companies out there that seem to just be enamored with this idea or, or want to latch onto this idea of blockchain, but the use case isn't actually a value add, doesn't actually apply to the business. And, and it's more, it's almost more of a hurdle than, than actually a, a, a benefit and a value add. Um, and, and so, you know, for, for someone in my shoes, I'm actively looking for ways to, you know, obviously integrate that technology, but only in the ways that it actually provides true value add from, you know, from the beginning, uh, et cetera. So, so kind of dovetailing off of that though, I'm curious, you know, uh, paint us a picture. Um, you know, in a few a few minutes here, because I think we're running up on time. But uh, take right. a few minutes and paint us a picture of what you think. You know, maybe the next three to five year trajectory looks like in terms of the you know these what you're absolutely offensive reality. Sure. What are the next things? And then if you can get maybe pinpoint some things that you believe you know, especially in the oil and gas space, that are going to be tangible benefit add, value add that may you may or may not be available now. But kind of set us sure set thing. us a scene. It's, it's all going. about having. Um, certified wearable devices that can that your that that are that are approved and safe and can go out in the field with um with the employees, right? Because anything that can go out in the field with with them um, that allows them to have access to the infinite amount of data 
that is available, you know, through through the cloud, um, uh, through through your own, you know, private servers and whatnot. Um, empowering that, empowering Joe Rigworker to become a subject matter expert on whatever it is that he's looking at in seconds, knowing where he is, how long he's been working on this task, where he's stuck. Um, having real time data fed into, you know, basically something the size of uh, a big pair of Oakley's um, that's attached to a mobile device. Um, that is, that's kind of where everything is headed. And, you know, you have groups like Chevron and Exxon and Halliburton that are, you know, the, the precursors to all this are the, are the small handheld mobile applications that they're using for training and, and right now. And that's where kind of a lot, I see a lot of inquiries, um, are into things like you've got realware. You've got HoloLens, the, the HoloLens 2 that's just come out. And these are massive devices in some cases, and they just don't lend themselves to, um, uh, to being as safe, as intrinsically safe as they should be. Uh, when, when you're looking at, you know, life and death are on the line. But the amount of data that's out there, um, that can be translated into a 3D image of the world that we live in is ready to be linked up to, to these devices as they, as they come on. Um, and I really think that, that that's where it's going is having a user able to have his hands free and I'm looking at a box and there's something wrong. And, and I've gone through this a million times, but I'm stressed because it's loud out there. Um, I, I smell smoke. You know, people start panicking um, and they don't think clearly. So the ability to tap your glasses, contact the subject matter expert or whoever it is back in Houston or New York or Singapore or wherever, and now they're seeing what you're seeing and they're able to tap and type on their computer and you're seeing everything that they're doing up here, right? Like the matrix, like Iron Man, you know, like minority report in front of you saying, grab this nozzle, turn it 15 degrees to the left and able to walk somebody through this process. Um, that's going to be, you know, massive, uh, leaning towards the, you know, ultimate removing human error, not humans, but removing human error to the point where, um, your safety and the potential for the potential for catastrophe is diminished just exponentially by having more and smarter minds put into um, potentially dangerous situations. And, and I think that through the Internet of Things and through this wearable technology, um, we're going to start seeing, especially like in the next year or two, um, a lot more people trying to onboard these these items. I'm already seeing a, a lot of people that are kind of asking these questions. You know, and it starts off with the small proof of concept, um, you know, changing a tire, um, something like that, um, changing a belt on a, on a drive. Um, and then the next thing you know, it's, uh, I mean, it's very much everybody's connected and you've got this, I mean, it is a little big brother esque, but I think that a lot of people understand that it's worth it when you're looking at saving lives, you're looking at saving money, you're looking at, you know, every bit of downtime is, uh, it's pretty significant when you're looking at a hundred dollars, eighty dollars, sixty dollars a barrel. Okay, final question, and I'll make it a two-parter here. Um, first off, uh, give me thirty seconds to a minute on how you overcome the objection of cost for new technology, and just kind of maybe some some ideas or tips for listeners. And then for folks who want to know more about what you're doing, where you're at, website, conferences, social media, wherever you want to point them to, go ahead and get that in there as well. Sure. Okay, sure. Um, it's it's always cost, right? It, it always comes down to, um, you know, how much is the first question. The most important question is why, right? What, are, what am I going to get out of this? Um, and pointing people to that return on their investment. You're going to spend, I'm just going to say, you know, X dollars. You're going to spend X dollars on this multimedia, virtual reality, augmented reality marketing solution that's going to take all of your existing marketing material. So now they're not having to spend money on stuff that they've already done. Right. They're able to use everything that they already have. You incorporate that into the solution that they have. And then you point to, OK, it, how many you know, units or um, how many subscriptions are you going to have to sell in order to get this? And it's it, with these technologies that that return on investment is a lot more rapid than than people might think. And, and they, what I normally do is I just point them to um, successes that, that we've had in the past and use cases that we've had in the past. 
Um, but putting it into that kind of comparative bucket of how much, how much are you going to spend on, you know, your old mundane marketing or how much are you going to spend on updating these PDFs or how much are you going to spend on all this? Well, we're giving you a solution that allows you to do all that stuff in the future as well. So you got this, it's not a sunk cost. You're able to use any media, 3D models, PDFs, so on and so forth that you've had in the past. Um, you're basically creating a, you know, a platform solution for these people, a fit for purpose platform solution for these people that allows them to, um, to save money, uh, by not having to, to rebuild this application every year, as opposed to constantly rebuilding their marketing material in the form of PDFs and videos and, and so on and so forth. Um, that that's there, there's several things that I go over with them, but you know, in this kind of short time, that's probably the first, the first part of that conversation that I would have with them. Okay. Well, and then as far yeah, as yeah, you know, people find you. I'm just, yeah. So, um, Mustang, like the horse, Mustang XR Consulting dot com, um, and you can find me under Mustang XR Consulting on Facebook and Instagram. Um, and if you're ever hanging out in Houston eating barbecue, you can probably find me at the pit room. Um, and we do a lot of business over there. No lie. Uh, Ben's down there right now. So Ben, I expect you. I'll be down tomorrow. Excellent. So why don't Ben buy barbecue for everyone who listens to this podcast tomorrow? Lunch on Ben at the pit. There we go. If, if you make it to Houston, food's on me. Food's on you. Okay. I, I can't do it. Unfortunately, I can't do it tomorrow. But, you know, that, yeah. that's not yeah, important. Yeah, facts, yeah. Not, a, not important. Don't don't facts. Not, not okay. important. Well, it was wonderful to get you on. Uh, fascinating stuff. Good information, Richard. Appreciate your time. And, uh, we'll Thank you so all much. Your Thank you so much for notes. having me. Appreciate the time. Appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Okay, Ben, let's go ahead and land this bird. Um, what did you think about Richard's advice on the show today? Yeah, I think that that was great. I, I think that it's really important, uh, you know, to, to hear the, the messages of not only you know some of the things that you and I have talked about, um, you know, through the podcast in terms of the consulting, you know, consultative selling, and if you're pitching a service or or something that is a little bit foreign and unfamiliar, that you need to come into those meetings with a a, a very clear understanding of you know what the client has, what they need, and and what the value you can provide is. Because, you know, there, there's a lot of barriers to entry when you're talking about these kind of foreign technologies. And so I think he framed that really well. Um, it's going to be interesting to see. I mean, you know, like he said, I think that a lot of this is kind of the quote unquote wave of the future or, you know, whatever you want to call it. I think these things are going to be taking more and more market share down. And so it's always good to kind of hear from the ground up what, you know, what they're working on. You know, I don't remember exactly how the quote goes, but it's something like this is that, you know, what they do is solving a problem, but what their clients are doing is actually solving a problem. And, you know, that's an interesting way to think about it because you think of the client as having a project, but the client's actually just solving a problem. They got to get a pipeline built. And it's like, you know what? That's actually, it actually simplifies things on some level because you're just part of a problem solving uh, mechanism, not, not trying to get latched onto a process or a, or, uh, you know, they're they're building a facility, or they're doing this or that, but it's just they're solving a problem. They got to you know, got this money, and they got to deploy it to get this asset or, or whatever it might be. So I thought that was an interesting way. I mean, it's it's one of those things when you say it's like, oh, well, no, duh, but it's it's a it's a different framework to um, sometimes some of what we do can get kind of daunting and overwhelming. It's like, oh man, they're doing this. No, they're just they're just trying to solve a problem, and you're you're part of that process. So I thought that was a good good perspective. So thank you again, Richard, for coming on. Ben, you will be at the Produce Water Society event. Is that Wednesday this week? When is that? That is Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Um, oh, no. I'm chairing a session on Wednesday. I don't have a booth this time, so I'm going to be just sitting there listening to the rest of it. And uh, Chairing a session? Good- yes. Chairing a session. I, I Does that mean you're going to be speaking? You're like, you're uh, be sitting like, on a big, like a big Flavor Flav chair with a clock necklace just hanging out and like – I like that. I don't it, like that. I mean, it's. I mean, it's one of the, it's one of those things that if, that if I you know if I'm sitting there for a couple hours and I don't say anything, that means that it went well. If I'm talking a lot. That probably means it's not going very well. Because uh, I mean, who would want to hear me talk? But you know, that's. Uh, I'm getting away with a lot this week, so we should probably just wrap this thing up. Uh, did Ryan we talk about loves the listening online? to you did talk, we, Ben. Did, did we talk about this or uh, we briefly mentioned it with Richard coming on? I think. So. Well, hopefully the but folks we, we at made the it. We made it. We, Water we got Society there. get to hear you um, talk at length about your vast and depth knowledge of produced water and society in general. So, um, Ben, Samuel, I really appreciate that. Val- I really appreciate that dialogue compliment. That's really yes, nice yeah. of you. I I, 
from the bottom, yes, deep in the heart there. Um, ben Samuels, it was good to be back. Listeners, it was good to be back as well. Um, when we'll be back, I guess next next week, right, bud? We're back, roaring again, man! It's can't wait. So excited. This train is not stopping. Yes, it's sir. Not stopping. All right, listeners, thank you so much, and we'll be back next week. Goodbye. Thanks, Ryan.